At 12 months, Nathan really started to withdraw from the family and, and extended family. He wasn't, we could see the change in pictures. He, one month, was looking at the camera and was bright, and you could see into his eyes, and then within a month, it changed, and he wasn't looking at camera, and he wasn't focusing, and he wouldn't look at you in the eye anymore. I was afraid to go in public and take him to the grocery store because people were judging me and making mean comments about my kids' behavior. Nobody in our family or in our close friends or anybody that we know has a child with autism. We were really... All we knew about autism was Rain Man, really. Yeah, really. That, that was it. We, we uh, didn't understand it, what the capabilities were of an autistic child, what we should expect from him in life in general. How we, wide the spectrum is, you know, it's... We, we didn't just, know absolutely didn't know anything. Autism is something that appears in the first year or two of a child's life. Now, in a typical child, you'll see that very early on, they'll want to do things. They'll want to see what other kids are doing, and they'll want to do it too. For a child with autism, it's almost like that's missing. They're growing, they're developing, they're smart, but they're lacking that connection to other people. He's, he's not caring about who's around him and what's going on. He's, he's totally somewhere else. His, mentally, he's somewhere else. They figure out what they like and what they want, but they figure out how to get it themselves. He would take us over to the drawer where the cups were, open the drawer, and put our hand on a cup to let us know that he was thirsty. It was never, he would, he would go through all of those actions before he would speak to us or point or anything simple. We see them being very oversensitive to things that don't necessarily bother other people. He, he would push away, he didn't want any contact, he didn't want to be hugged, he didn't want to be kissed, he didn't like anything near his face. We see a lot of families that are struggling. They're struggling to get through each day. We weren't sleeping. I was afraid to sleep because Ethan was escaping outdoors and windows. Ethan has no concept of danger, and so he will dart out into traffic, he will dart out of the school, he just... I find myself on a, on a wave of emotion, of, of, of a grief process, really, of of not hitting something and grieving for that loss, not gr grieving for that benchmark, and then having to move forward and setting my sight somewhere else. We had an idea of what life was going to be like. We had a, a one-year-old girl and now a newborn boy. And we had this idea of they were going to be so close and best friends. And that, that just disappeared. We've spent seven years fighting to get even the smallest amount of what that dream was supposed to be back. The one thing that really stands this organization out is if you take a look at the vision statement and mission statement that we have, it talks about quality service provi provision to any client that enters our doors. It, has the structure of financial management, of programming management, but you add to that the flavoring of an eight-member board, a governing board, that's driven by parents. Parents being involved in making decisions of the quality of service that we're currently providing. In the co-op model, families are given the power to determine what their services look like, and how they're done, and how they're going to look in the future. It makes sure that they're not at the mercy of the system, but that they're a partner with the system. Every single family has the opportunity to be a part of that process. We believe that 
families know what they need and can better identify it than we can. We feel like AZA, uh, the services provided by AZA, is really what makes a difference in us feeling like a family instead of us feeling like we are managing autism. This organization was started by a group of families. When they thought about the future, the things their children were going to need did not exist. And they didn't know who was going to create those or if anybody would create those. If a family creates something that's going to work for their child, there's going to be another family and many more after that that need the same thing. Ethan has benefited so much from the services that we've received. Um, and I have benefited so much from these services because I have learned how to communicate with my child and understand what it is that he is going through. If I did not have AZA United to teach me how to cope with the trials, tribulations, and struggles that we go through every day that I could not even explain to a typical mom. One of the things that, that we do really well is we offer a continuum of supports. Um, you know, it's not just clinical, emotional support for the families, it's guidance, what we do is we don't come into a situation uh, claiming to have all the answers. A speech pathologist comes in and, and Jack just sits right down for Susan and we're thinking, wow, what is Susan's Kung Fu? We need to learn this Kung Fu. This is good. Having an organization that is willing and ready to give every opportunity, every resource. I can call Aaron up tomorrow and he'll answer my questions personally you know it's 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 so family oriented and so such a personal company that um, it means a lot to us to just know that those services are there the research represents a piece of the real world so that tells us about half of what we need to do but the other half has to come from families it has to come from real people who are getting services who need services and who know what they're missing I was at a very, very low place. And had I not had AZA United to teach me and give me some tools and some skills, I don't know where our family would be. I don't think that Ethan would be speaking. Snowball! It's important for families like our family to have a place to go, to have people who can tell you you're not the only person in the world who's feeling this. But AZA United's gonna be here and we're gonna help you when you need help. Do this. Good job! I think as parents, we get comfortable with how they are and how to adapt to what they need. And habilitators are there to bring out what they should be doing. You take sharing and, and following a game's directions for granted, but for Nathan, those were big, big yeah. things for him to learn. Although those uh, developmental markers came late, um, habilitators have really been a key part of making them come at all. Whose turn is it? Turn is it? It's me. It's Bully's turn. Can you say, it's your turn? Thank you. It is. It is. Sissy's turn. Can you say, it's, it's your turn. Wonderful. It was a blessing to find AZA and for my mom to go, hey, I want you to be a, a habilitator and a respite provider for him um, because you can help. And it, it makes you feel so much better when you know that you can do something. <laughs> More tickles? Tickles. <laughs> if you're supporting AZA, then you're helping support families. The very structure of the organization is grounded with people that care. The willingness to listen, the willingness to expand and live out the very 
vision and mission statement that they have. Our role is to bridge the gap for families, to take what works from research and best practices and boil it down to each individual family, to their living room, to their dinner table, to their family vacations. If we're not able to plan and execute a family vacation the way that is best for him, it ruins the vacation for the entire family. Parents are the are the receivers of that type of service. It's critical that they become the evaluators, the assessors. Are we hitting the mark? The reason I've stayed with AZA is because of the extra care, the extra programs that we've received through AZA. As the child is growing, the family is evolving, we are too. And the family is helping us make sure that we create the things that they need. In five years, I envision our organization with its current pattern of growth statewide. As we reach the underserved in Maricopa County, we need to start looking at Flagstaff in Tucson and all of Arizona. Bigger is not necessarily better. The notion is, is it driven by need by our client population? Can we do it in a sustained manner that it will sustain itself over a period of time? A lot of the feedback that we receive from our parent population has been the need to expand for more services. Uh, a key part to that expansion is the fact that it's driven by some sound decision-making of sustainability. One of our biggest priorities is to make sure that every family who needs help can get it. And that's where we fit into the scope of community services. I'm just discovering his sense of humor that I think is Oh, sometimes just so funny. Like I was doing dishes yesterday and I had been in the kitchen for maybe an hour and a half, not paying any attention to him. Yeah. He's just doing his own thing. And he was real tired of, you're not paying attention to me, mom. He went and grabbed my wig from my clown costume. It's a rainbow wig, it's a big rainbow Afro. wig. Afro. And I'm leaning over washing dishes and he goes like this and sticks his head <laughs> underneath. And I see the biggest smile, and of course he has no front teeth here, so a big toothless grin with a rainbow wig, and he goes, <laughs> and when I lose it and start laughing, he goes, ah, and runs off laughing like, it like, works. Yes. And Goofy comes from somewhere, and he's walking up, and uh, Nathan and sees him, Nathan sees him, and he just, he Nathan runs. puts his arms up and runs to him, and Goofy, he crouches down and get, scoops him up and swinging him with Swing legs him flying through the, the air. Attack. It was the cutest thing. It was like long lost friends had come together. And it, was. Goofy. it was just the cutest thing. <laughs> that, was so, that, was, that was amazing. It was really funny. <laughs> and then when he's on a Dr. Seuss loop and he repeats Green Eggs and Ham the entire book from front to back repeatedly at 3.30 in the morning over and over and over and over and over again for about an hour and 45 minutes, you'll catch yourself saying, Ethan! <laughs> Stop talking! <laughs> or then I bite my tongue going, oh, I swore God, I swore I'd never say that, I'm so sorry. For a, for a long time, his favorite movie quote was now on DVD from the previews. Uh, he would, he'd have his little letters and everywhere around the house you'd find spelled out, now on DVD. And he would, that, that was his favorite movie quote for a very long time. Again, and then he goes, go to the right, go up over, go to the AZA and see Miss Tracy at the clinic with the toys. And you're just like, Ugh. and you turn around and he's just, where did that come from? Go to the AZA for and an hour. And how do you know where we go? were downtown? Because he pays attention, he knows where we he's, are. He's happy and um, he handles his conditions. I don't even know how to explain it. Um, if I was in his shoes, <laughs> I'm probably gonna start crying actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. You start crying. Pick your nose, Carter. That means. No. <laughs> But the first time that he said, I love you, sissy, and looked me dead in the eye, it's like you want to whip out the checkbook and say, okay, how much? He and has an amazing laugh, sense of humor. His laugh is contagious. He, it's just infectious. Uh, in the past six months, he's just fallen in love with the show America's Funniest Videos. And, to uh, watch him watch it is one of my favorite things. What are you watching? <laughs> what? <laughs> Cracks it up. Just the deepest belly laughs. <laughs> I don't think I could have expected 
a better kid. You know, I really could not. <laughs>